Uh, I'm going to leave the, uh, the task of introducing each of the speakers to my colleague, Henry Jenkins, uh, but I do want to say one uh, thing first. Uh, uh, one of the speakers uh, today, uh, um, Aswin, you need to help me with the last name again. Uh, Aswin Punathak. <laughs> I, I screwed it up again. I'm sorry. You can see his name there. It's my Anglo-Saxon weaknesses that make it impossible for me to say Indian names. I apologize. Uh, Aswin is a, uh, is a graduate of the MIT uh, uh, program in comparative media study. And to my knowledge, he is the first such graduate to speak at a communications forum event. So this is a doubly interesting and exciting moment for those of us in CMS. Here's, here's him. So I'm Henry Jenkins, and I'm going to be moderating this discussion. Um, the, sort of, the title Global Media tells us next to nothing about what we're going to be talking about for the next, hour, or next two hours. Uh, there's so many theories of globalization out there, so many ways it connects to the word media. So the first thing we're really going to try to do is get on top of that. For the moment, we, I, I think we might describe it as locally and nationally specific modes of production and consumption in a context of global circulation. That is, we're going to be very interested in, on a local level, the decisions that get made to produce content that's going to see, be seen by audiences around the world. And what we, there's, the national still plays a very important role in our understanding of what constitutes global media. In no sense does the nation state disappear but the, the relationship of local media industries to a global marketplace are changed profoundly. Just to give two examples in the last week uh, that would sort of point to this. Uh, the first is that at least as of Monday afternoon, 100 million people have seen Susan Boyle's <laughs> appearance on Britain's Got Talent, right? An extraordinary story. Just by point of comparison, 37 million people saw the final episode last season of American Idol, one of the highest rated shows on American television. So, so far close to three times the number of people have downloaded Susan Boyle's video on YouTube as watched the high, one of the highest rated shows on American television. <coughs> this is a global phenomenon. It's worth, and all the fuss that's been made about Susan Boyle, we lose track of the fact that it's from a television show that's not commercially available in this market. Indeed, if people get hooked into the Susan Boyle story, they won't be able to follow it on broadcast television. Although pirates are already there, right? You can go and BitTorrent and see Britain's Got Talent easily enough, but you're not going to be able to see it on American networks. And so it says something, even when 100 million people in the United States are in, or around the world are interested in this content, there's still borders and barriers that block entry of international content into the United States, and we've got to actually think about that. Even when we're talking about commercially produced content in English language from Great Britain, one of our closest allies. The second marker I wanted to point out is YouTube uh, launched a movie channel in the last couple of weeks, which has the content organized by genre. And one of the genres they organize content by is foreign film. Now, what does it mean for YouTube, which operates is globally accessible, to have a category of foreign film. Who is it foreign to? Right? You know, uh, what, what is, how, how do people understand their experience where one country is able to produce film that's seen globally and is seen as, Amer you know, just Hollywood, and every other filmmaking industry in the world gets labeled as foreign and glumped into the same genre by a global media company like YouTube. So this points to the degree to which, as a society, we're in a very contradictory state in terms of having much more greater access to global content than ever before and not having developed our conceptual framework to think about it very well. So each of the speakers today will be talking about different national contexts, different genres, different modes of circulation, but we hope that together they give us a snapshot of how the media a global media system is beginning to take shape and what the implications are of this, global, this, this increased but not yet there system of global circulation of media. So that said, uh, the opening this up, we're going to, each of the speakers are going to give a very brief opening comments describing some of their research and thought in this area, and then we're going to start mixing it up with some of the topics that are on the board there, and eventually open it up to you to the floor for questions and comments, participation, which is always the highlight of any of our communication forum events. So first up is uh, As Aswin Puntabeker. Uh, a 2003 graduate of MIT Comparative Media Studies Master's Program. I'm really proud to have him there for that reason. 
He studies globalization, cultural industries, new media and media convergence, and public culture. He's currently working on a book that provides an historical and critical account of ongoing changes in the media sector in Bombay and examines the operations of film, television, and dot-com companies as they grapple with the challenges of imagining Bollywood as a global cultural industry. Very good. So for a few days in February 2009, nearly about 3,000 individuals, executives, directors, producers, policymakers, bureaucrats, from all over the world came together for a number of days in Bombay to celebrate a decade of the globalization of Indian film and television. And while this three-day convention organized by the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry attracted participants from a range of industries, there was no doubt that the proceedings were dominated by this thing that we now recognize as Bollywood. And over three days, a number of panel sessions tackled various aspects of change that the film industry has undergone over the past decade, a decade since the government officially granted industry status to cinema and initiated a discourse of corporatization. And of course, over these days, there was a lot of disagreement over what actually Bollywood needs to look like, Debate about mer debates about the merits of Hollywood-style organization and practices versus the family-run and kinship-based model that has defined the workings of the film industry since the late 1940s, partnerships with Hollywood studios, treaties with organizations like the UK Film Council, piracy and so on. And as I wandered from one panel to another, I started just making a list of people, of places, of companies, of different kinds of organizations that seemed to have a stake in these discussions of Bollywood and of the globalization of Indian cinema. And among the people who were there was Yash Chopra, who's the chairman of, chairman of this very important film committee a stalwart of the industry and who, along with his son, Aditya Chopra, is seeking to redefine Yashraj films as a new kind of global media company. There was Karan Johar, another filmmaker who has played a crucial role in redefining relations between the diaspora and, and the filmmaking industry in Bombay. And while these established players in the Bombay media world made their appearances on various panels, there were other individuals, organizations, and companies that were also involved. So to begin with, as you saw, the U.S. was a partner country throughout this convention, and the U.S. commercial service had a very prominent presence. And that little shot you saw of the stall, oddly enough, for this, throughout those four days, there was nobody manning that booth. It was just this stall of saying U.S. commercial service, buy USA, and that was it. We'd, I never quite figured out who was behind this, why they'd set up the stall, and so on. And there were multinational film companies and television companies, Sony, Colors, which is a Viacom-owned company with, within a year, is now the leading satellite television company. And there was Z Cafe, there was MIP TV of television sales urging executives from Bombay to travel. But there were also others, Shekhar Kapoor from London, a 15-person delegation from the UK Film Council. Anadil Hossein, who runs a company called Dillywood, which acts as a mediator for film companies coming from Bombay, a diasporic entrepreneur who handles everything from lodging to food to travel for film crews that travel here. There was Anjula Bhatt, CEO and, CEO and co-founder of Desi Hits, a New York-based web portal involved in creating a space for Desi remix fusion music. And individuals from Warner Brothers, Fox Searchlight, Disney, NBC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, a number of venture capitalists, and so on. Now, many, while many of the panel discussions were focused on, and they actually revealed a lot of confusion, <coughs> conflicts, and tensions in the ongoing kind of negotiations around redefining a national film industry into what many of us, many people want to call as Bollywood, a global cultural industry. One sense that was very, very clearly emerging was, in spite of all these confusions, one thing was clear, that the spatial coordinates of this thing that we call Bollywood had changed dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years. So the answer to the question, where in the world is Bollywood, or how is the world in Bollywood, would have to be, it depends. So here's one possible mapping, yeah? Um, we can begin with, say in the northern suburbs of Bombay with Yashraj firms in the Lokhandwala complex, which is comparable to perhaps the Burbank area in California where a number of film and television companies have their offices. And from here we could slowly move up a little north to take a look at the film city a little further north in Goregaon, Mumbai, which offers a range of spaces, a range of production options. And from here, keeping in mind 
that the redefinition of Bollywood spatial coordinates began to change when satellite television made an appearance in India in the early 1990s, we could move to the south of the city, to the offices of MTV, and to all the transnational advertising agencies. And then from there, maybe all the way to London, where the UK Film Council is based, and where people like Shekhar Kapoor are invested in forging stronger ties with a range of players in Bombay as well. And from here, we could then move to Burbank, where companies like Warner Brothers, Disney, and Fox Searchlight are all trying to figure out, and their imaginations and practices are also caught up in redefining Bombay, the Bombay film industry into Bollywood Inc. But the one thing that I do want to point out is let's not forget that this is only one possible map, and that if we follow this map, we could begin to develop an understanding of how the imaginations and practices of state institutions, this was organized by the national an institution of the federal government, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. And we could also map the imaginations and practices of different industry professionals. But there are some other parts of the world which are also involved in recreating Bollywood's or reimagining Bollywood's geographic reach. So here's another possibility. We could move from the suburbs of Bombay to Karachi in Pakistan, a, which is a renowned sort of hub for media piracy, and from there to Dubai which complicates matters a little bit more given the city's position as an important media capital in both legitimate and illegitimate ways. And from there, all the way to Beirut in Lebanon, where distributors, as Brian Larkin has shown us, were invested in circulating Bollywood films for over three decades now. And from Lebanon all the way into Nigeria, where the circulation of popular Hindi cinema has not only inspired local filmmakers, but has set up a new kind of path of circulation for Bollywood over the last few decades as well. And all of these places, this kind of new, this mapping from Bombay to Karachi to Dubai to Nigeria was very much a kind of what Ravi Sundaram has called a pirate modernity, where the culture of the copy actually defines both the production but also the circulation of these sorts of films and television programs. So as we begin considering what seems like a rather dizzying assemblage of media technologies, of people, of capital, I'm inclined to agree with anthropologist William Majorella's observation that there is really no simple correlation anymore between the spatiality of cultural production and the production of cultural space. And as we begin delving more and more into these sorts of maps and circuits, it becomes clear that we're forced to confront the limits of established media studies paradigms that even today carve up the space of media culture into production, reception, or at best, a syncretic approach that takes us through maybe a circuit of culture of sorts. And while some scholars have tried to shift our attention to thinking about television sales and distribution and how that creates new circuits of circulation, I'm not convinced that these established models are adequate. And I'd like to finish up this by suggesting that maybe approaching all of this by thinking about circulation, as Brian Larkin has done in the context of Nigeria and that the C3 team here has done in talking about spreadability, is maybe a way forward. And what I'd like to do in the rest of the conversation is to perhaps consider how focusing on circulation might allow us, might actually inform and revitalize our field, and maybe even define a new kind of problematic from which to then approach the question of media globalization to understand how one particular city in the world is not only emerging as a media capital, but has actually historically over time managed to maintain its position as a dominant media capital. All right, so next up is Carolina Acosta Alzuru. She's associate professor at Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Georgia. As a native of Georgia, and I'm proud to see uh, someone from my home state here at MIT, uh, a native of Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, Carolina teaches public relations, graphic communication, and cultural studies, and she studies telenovelas and their diverse audiences. I'm just going to show you first a clip, since some people don't know what telenovelas are, and so just show you how this, you don't need to understand. Oh, 
ruego. Te ruego que creas en mí. actually and yes um, end of episodes are really important because those are the cliffhangers so telenovelas are all over the world but some people think they're like soap operas like the American soap operas they are like soap operas they aren't like soap operas they are like soap operas because they're melodramatic because they're every day of the week they're not like soap operas because they have an end they have 120 episodes maybe 300 episodes, but they end. The American soap opera only ends 50 years later or something like that. <laughs> and that makes a huge difference in how people relate to the characters, in how people relate to the stories, and also telenovelas in Latin America are not only in the afternoon block, they are on prime time. They're the most important television genre in Latin America. So let me take you really quickly through this very complicated telenovela world and it's interesting because Bollywood has sort of erased or blurred all these distinctions between production and consumption. And here you're going to see it's not as easy to blur the, these this limitations or the, the limits between production and consumption. So let's see if this thing works. Um, Two billion is the global audience of telenovelas. 12,000 hours are produced every year. They're watching almost every region of the world. Um, they are currently in a new phase in, in the last 15 years. Maciotti says, calls it transnational. Guillermo Orozco calls it mercantile. But really, the emphasis is on sales. There's a, there has always been this tension between the cultural and the business aspects of telenovela. The business aspects is eating the cultural aspect. Uh, so it's becoming sort of standardized, and we'll talk about what kind of standard is being used increasingly. Um, not only exclusively produced in Latin America, many countries in which telenovelas were watched are now producing their own. And there's a huge uh, international market for the format. You know, you sell the format and each country produces it. So telenovela, the telenovela world has become the empire of what we call the remake. And if you want to talk about remakes, we have to talk about her. This is the original Betty, the Colombian Betty, Yo Soy Betty La Fea. <laughs> and of course, we know that the world is full of Bettys now, including the US Betty, which by the, by the way, Ugly Betty is not a telenovela. And so this is the empire of the remake, and is this good? Look at all of them. They all have braces, they all have eyeglasses, they all have they are all endearing. They have to be. If not, they're not Betty. So, but let's go to Latin America, because Latin America and Spain, you know, where people speak Spanish and Portuguese in Latin America and Spain, these are the big markets still, the original markets. And these are the number of telenovelas on the air in each of these countries in March, last month. Okay, so huge. Ecuador, who produces only two telenovelas, they have 37 on the air. So who are the major producers? Well, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Venezuela have been traditionally the producers. Colombia is sort of a newcomer. In the last 10 years, it has become huge. But we have also a new player. And this is a player that defines, defies the nation state, Telemundo. Telemundo is located in Miami. Headquarters in Miami, but it co-produces with Colombia RTI. And it is a huge player, as we will see. So how is the pie divided in the Americas and Spain? Well, 32% of telenovelas on the air come from Mexico. And this is something I want you to start noticing. This is how the pie, the whole pie in the Americas and Spain works. But if we look at the at each of these major producers, they're also consumers. So what's on the air in Argentina? This is what's on the air in Argentina. Nothing from Venezuela, something from the rest. But how are Argentinian telenovelas? 
They are producers, so what do they produce? Until the 1990s, they underscored a lot of the local. They were, I loved them, because I thought they, were, they would say a lot about the country. Not anymore, not anymore. Now the international market is the goal to get that, so now they're trying to become standardized. So not the same. They also have an accent issue. The accent in Spanish from Argentina is something that is not widely acceptable in other Spanish-speaking countries. So they say they have a, an, an accent issue, and sometimes they try to neutralize that, which is a shame, I think. Um, but they have a success. They've, they've become the big marketers of uh, youth-oriented telenovelas, and they sell lots and lots of formats. There's a huge producer called Cris Morena that sells lots of this. Look at Brazil. Open television, this is what they watch. Brazilian telenovelas, okay? <laughs> they are fabulous, okay? It's the realism in telenovelas. Social, cultural issues, political issues are part of the telenovela. It's not just a love story. The context of the story is pretty important. Characters are not Manichaean, not goody, 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 so good and naive, she's stupid and evil, evil, evil with this eyebrow permanently <laughs> like that. No, not like that in Brazil. And the characters, because they're not Manichaean, they evolve, which is pretty nice in a storyline. High production values. This is, this is like Hollywood, the way they produce. It's beautiful. Remarks are rare. They produce new stories all the time. It's a very strong industry. Language issue, they're in Portuguese. So they're dubbed in the rest of, Amer of Latin America, and some people don't like that. They like to watch their telenovelas in the original language. What about Colombia? This is what they watch in Colombia. Look, no Brazilian telenovelas in Colombia. Humor, lots of it. Characters are defined by a main trait, so sometimes they seem a bit cartoonish, but you can't take away your eye from them. They're fun. It's fresh, the storylines feel fresh. They do not shy away from showing local context and local problems. They've had telenovelas with lots of drug issues, drug trafficking, the narco traffic, et cetera, the obsession with plastic surgery, all that you can find. What about Mexico? 72% is from Mexico, some from Telemundo. The, and the ones in Telemundo are shown on TV Azteca. Televisa, the big giant, only shows what they produce. And a little bit from Colombia also in TV Azteca. None of the rest. Mexican telenovelas are what you think about when you think of telenovelas. Very melodramatic, moralistic. The characters, this are it. She is so beautiful and naive. She is ridiculous. And he's such a hunk, but he's not particularly intelligent. <laughs> and so, and they are like that all the way until the happy end. Of course, the evil ones will pay dearly. Crime and punishment, and punishment is huge. <laughs> Context tends to be unimportant. The, it, these are uh, underscored by the Catholic principles, these telenovelas. Very predictable. There's always a big mansion with a huge staircase and the big evil mother-in-law will throw the protagonist down the stairs so she loses her baby, always. <laughs> they don't write new stories. These are remakes and remakes and remakes. In the last 10, 12 years, Mexican telenovelas in Televisa have all been remakes of old telenovelas. <clears throat> what about Venezuela? They have a more balanced thing. Why? Because we're not producing much. That's why the pie looks more balanced. So, Telenovelas in Venezuela, if you take the Mexican model, melodrama, and the Brazilian model, realism, you can place all Venezuelan telenovelas somewhere in that continuum. Some are very realistic. There was a telenovela, I wrote a book about a telenovela in which there was a character that was a metaphor of Hugo Chavez, the president. So that realistic, okay? <coughs> but there are also the melodramatic ones. The industry is heavily affected by the country's political situation. President Chavez closed RCTV, a huge telenovela producer, because they were in the opposition. The other network, Venevisión, is terrified. So there's a lot of self-censorship going on. 
And because RCTV is out, Venevision has no local competition. So the industry is completely deformed. The local market is deformed. They win no matter what they broadcast. So this is, it's a very sad situation. Therefore, it has lost terrain in the international arena. You can see it by the other pie charts. Now, so these are, this is sort of a summary of all the pie charts, just so you remember. And here are the telenovelas broadcast in the US. Okay, in the US we have three major players, Univision, Telemundo, and Azteca America. And this is what we see. Half, almost half of the telenovelas are from Mexico. And these are, of course, the makeup of Latinos in the US. 66.8% come from Mexico, and then the rest. And if we look at the census numbers for people that are not born in the US, that live in the US, look at the major producers, the Mexico. A third of people who are not born in the US who live here are from Mexico. So it's a major player. So if you are going to decide in Univision and all these networks who, what kind of telenovelas you're going to show the Hispanic population, you're going to think of the, what are they watching when they grow up. And this is what they watch when they were growing up. So they have been taking this bottle since birth, which is Televisa. And this is what Univision offers. Univision offers just Televisa. These are the pie charts for Univision, Azteca America, and Telemundo. The major competition is between Telemundo and Univision. So there's what we call the Telemundo model, okay? What is it? It has two goals. Beat Univision and the international sales. Goal number one, they haven't achieved. They have improved, but they are not close. Big, big goal, international sales. They're selling a lot. They co-produce with Colombia. They have all sorts of things. They adapt old novels. They remake novels. They have a few original stories. Multinational cast. This is our, these are the stories in which the father has a Colombian accent, the mother has a Mexican accent, the daughter is Venezuelan, the other one is Ecuadorian. This is like the organization of American states. But at least the protagonist, one of them has to be Mexican because they know that the majority of the Hispanic population comes from Mexico. Beauty is always over talent in this model. <laughs> and they strive for a neutral accent, but frankly, it sounds most of the time like Mexico and a little bit Colombian, sometimes. The context of the stories is generic. You know, somewhere in Latin America, there's this gorgeous farm or cattle ranch. We don't know where. Oh, he went to the city, and it says, city, ciudad. <laughs> we don't know where this is. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that the girls have our show in their midriff. That's really important. OK, so this is sort of the Telemundo model. And there's a Miami model also, not made by Telemundo, by, by the branches of the big producers, they have branches in Miami to make telenovelas for the international market. Goal is international sales, all remakes and rehashing. You take three stories, you cut them in little pieces, and you produce something new with them, or old. It's very melodramatic. Again, the multinational cast. And here, the neutral accent really sounds me Mexican, and the vocabulary is very Mexican. The context of these storylines, luxury. They're all in beautiful, beautiful places. These two models are selling a lot elsewhere in the international arena. And the local telenovelas, producers, Colombia, Venezuela, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina are looking at that. And so we see this thing creeping in. So this is like the big panorama, and of course, we will get to talk about this later, but I just wanted to mention that there are these things that have disrupted the traditional, we produce, you consume telenovelas. YouTube is, the, is a huge archive of telenovelas, and this is, the, the, the people, people love it, the public loves it, if you are, in Romania, you can watch what's going on in Colombia, but some of the producers don't like this. So Televisa has been, you know, arguing with uh, YouTube 
At a point, they closed every single account that had a Televisa episode on YouTube. They closed them all. So there were thousands of users with accounts closed. Uh, Venevision in Venezuela doesn't allow their content to be seen outside of Venezuela. So, but the people, they don't take it. They rebel, and I can show you later how. Oh, sorry, well, blogs, of course, and there are many, many blogs, and there's also um, blogs in which they place the videos hidden from the networks. There are chats, there are message boards, all these things make the world, the telenovela world, seem a little bit smaller than it really is. It's really complex and big. And I know I've just given you like the broad strokes, but I guess with, a, with questions, we can put this together. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Jonathan Gray, who's, a, who's come, comes to MIT so often, we're starting to think of him as one of our <laughs> locals. Uh, he's an assistant professor of communications and media studies at Fordham University and soon to accept a new position at my uh, alma mater, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He's the author of Television Entertainment, Watching with the Simpsons. He's got a new book out on uh, satire TV uh, and he regularly contributes to the group blog, The Extra Textuals, Up the Content Stream Without a Paddle. Okay, um, so I, I wanted to talk to you about um, some ethnographic research I did in, in Malawi last summer, um, where I went largely to, to look at how um, media was consumed. I was particularly interested in, in how sort of ideas of America or of other countries, um, in particular South Africa or Nigeria, uh, were, uh, were developed through media consumption. Um, Malawi, uh, I mean, I, I'll just say a few words about Malawian media production, um, talking about sort of th three industries of, of film, television, and, um, and music, and then talk a bit more about consumption. Uh, with, with film, the, the, the story is quite quick. Uh, most people I talked to said that there were five Malawian films. Um, now, I couldn't confirm that number, but the mere fact that most people don't seem to know of many other Malawian films show that it is not much of a Malawian um, uh, film industry. As far as television goes, there's one uh, uh, public broadcaster, um, and, and that's it. Uh, and the, the public broadcaster plays largely live uh, elements, so it's it's partly C Spanish and showing a lot of uh, uh, parliamentary proceedings. Uh, Malawi football games get played, or soccer, sorry, uh, games get played, and then uh, we get some uh, music videos. Um, and then for music, there is much more of a sort of vibrant uh, level of production. Uh, Malawian music has, has been fairly successful in the region, uh, actually not just in, in Malawi. Um, and uh, Malawian reggae particularly has done fairly well. Um, although at the same time, as, as much as it's done well, when I say well, what I mean is it, it's circulated. Um, it's not at all financially lucrative. Uh, when I was there, one of the more successful um, Malawian musicians actually was, was working in the same town that I was at as a, um, his day job was uh, a research assistant where he got paid the equivalent of about 10 bucks a day. Uh, so he needed to do that even though he was one of the most, um, the, one of the more famous musicians in, in the country. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that rule, but by and large, uh, it, it's not a, an industry that pays a lot of money. So what we have in, in, in these sort of three main forms of sort of media production is, is a, a business that is not at all a big business. Uh, there's very, very little sort of room for uh, making uh, a lot of money. Um, what you do get, though, is a large amount of media uh, circulating nonetheless, uh, largely because it's, it's coming in from other countries. Um, in terms of, um, I can just sort of walk you through. First, um, for those of you who don't know where Malawi is, here we go. Um, Malawi, uh, unfortunately, became more famous for the fact that Madonna wanted to adopt her child there than, than uh, anything else. But um, there we go. Um, in between Zambia, Tanzania, and, and Mozambique, um, and the home to the second largest lake in the uh, continent. 
Um, I was doing my research in, in Rumpi up in the north and, and Luande. Um, there are two main cities, Blantyre and Lolongwe, um, and I wasn't there. Um, but a large amount of the, the population does actually live in the outlying towns, um, such as Rumpi and Luande. Um, so as far as going back to those industries, as far as film goes, um, there's a lot of film that gets watched, particularly at, at what we call video shows. Um, and here's an example of one with um, Arnie adorning the, uh, the, the governator on the outside. Um, uh, uh, video shows, uh, every town I, I went to had at least one video show, uh, often multiples. You get in for about five quacha, which uh, translates to about three cents. Um, and how it works is once you're in, uh, you can sort of stay in and watch as much as you want. Um, it's very interesting that it says Kelvin and Sheila videotape library for the best and latest movie. Um, because what I, I was really interested in is was a lot of the movies that were playing were not at all the latest movies that we would consider. It was very much a sort of flashback to the, the 80s um, and to the 90s with a lot of Schwarzenegger, Steven Seagal, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, it, it seemed the only exceptions, uh, the only time that I was seeing movies that had been released any time in around the last 10 years uh, were when they uh, had a, an African-American actor at the center of them. And, and largely what was playing was either Hollywood film uh, or you were also seeing um, some Nigerian films uh, playing as well. Um, how they'd work is you just outside, there'd be these, this thing telling you what was go going on. Um, None of these had been uh, legally purchased. It was all, uh, it was all piracy um, and, and pirate-led, um, and largely through VCDs um, and, and through uh, d two DVD collections that had been put together. Um, and then they would be watched, and this is a sort of average video show where you have this, this tiny uh, television at the front, and then the, the guys sitting around. Um, only guys. Um, it wasn't seemed acceptable for women to go into most video shows. I, I heard that this was different in the two main cities, but it certainly wasn't outside. So um, these were the, uh, the, the, the kids watching. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Um, this, it was also the video shows where you could watch some of the television. Um, again, not much Malawian television. Um, and there wasn't too much interest, I found, in, in television in, in general outside of uh, television as something that played movies. So the, the movie channels that would come in by satellite from South Africa uh, started to get picked up by some of the video shows that actually had a, a dish or a lot of bars, and particularly bars that serviced some of the, the foreign um, uh, researchers that were there. Uh, and so television largely became a sort of pr a medium that, that sort of overflowed outside of bars, and a lot of it would get watched with people standing watching uh, in the windows. Um, and uh, there wasn't much sort of in, in interest in, in series. And indeed, I, I saw only a few sort of uh, uh, recognizable series um, while there, the only two being CSI and Prison Break, uh, so go figure. Um, and then as far as music, uh, you would get multiple music sellers in, in each town at, at, at the, um, and, and this is an example of one from the Mangochi, which is one of the larger towns, um, where you're getting a, a lot of uh, DVDs and, and VCDs, and then also um, CDs for, for sale. Um, and the music, uh, I mean, one of the things that had actually led me to an in interest in Malawi was the, the oddity that is um, Dolly Parton's supreme um, uh, reign in, in Malawi. Dolly Parton is pretty much as big as it gets. Um, <laughs> Often, uh, rap, hip hop, R and B are the sort of key genres that have, have moved over uh, from uh, America, along with um, easy listening. Um, as with the, the popularity of Nigerian soaps, um, melodrama I think pr was particularly popular, and so you saw that through the popularity of Celine Dion and so forth. Um, country music w was huge, though, and particularly uh, Dolly. There's a sort of interesting story behind that because I'd asked, you know, why is Dolly so so big? And I continue uh, was interested in this, and largely it was uh, through a sort of quirk where, in around the 70s and 80s, there was a wave of missionaries who came into Malawi, largely from the south, um, and they brought uh, the country music with them, and then set up uh, offices in a country that largely has subsistence agriculture, and so it set up something of a middle class because you can now work in the offices rather than out in the fields. Uh, and so country music became the music of the middle class. I mean, 
somewhat ironic given that here it's seen as the, 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 you know, the music of, of white trash. Um, and so country music became a sort of sign perhaps of, of having you know, made it. Of course, there's also, you know, for a country where there's subsistence agriculture is, is the job for many people, uh, there's you know, some nice shoehorning of, of interest given what country music is about uh, at the same time. Uh, but so what we had was, uh, other than country music and uh, easy listening, uh, the, uh, which again was quite often very old, music from the sort of 70s and 80s. Um, the only sort of modern music that you were getting was again music largely by African American artists um, from, uh, uh, from the US uh, or music coming in from neighboring countries um, and there was a large amount of it. Um, so I mean what I wanted to do here was just give you a sort of a, a, a snapshot, all be it very brief because whereas I'm, I'm assuming most people in this room have, have some sort of very basic working familiarity with, with what Bollywood or telenovelas are as a concept. I'm also assuming very few of you have a basic working knowledge with Malawi, um, as evidenced by the fact that uh, one, one person, I think isn't here right now, uh, continually uh, asked me about my research in Maui, um, <laughs> a very different place. Um, but uh, I, and I thought that I could then turn to some of the, the, the uh, thematic questions that Henry ha has posed. Um, but I mean, the one thing I would throw down that I have particular interest in is, is what all of this um, suggested in terms of, of our continual fetishization in media studies with uh, the new. Uh, you know, Derek Comper has an excellent book called Rerun Nation, uh, where he sort of reminds us that a large amount of what's on television uh, in, in America is, is reruns. Um, and yet we continually talk about everything that's new. Um, and here I was in, in Malawi and a large amount of what was being listened to and what was being watched uh, was stuff that would have been considered sort of old and old fashioned and from you know, the sort of 80s and, and Jean-Claude Van Damme and, uh, and, and, and not you know, the, the modern ironic reinvention of, of Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, and, and so it, it made me, uh, I, I think there are some interesting questions to be asked about uh, the fetishization of the new. Um, and how uh, studying media globally perhaps uh, might force us to look at the different temporalities of media, not just uh, to pick up on, on Osman's issues uh, of uh, circulation, not just spatial circulation, but also the sort of temporality of circulation, uh, what moves where and how fast it moves and uh, what doesn't move there at all. Um, uh, so that for instance, again, as, as much as music moved around freely, uh, there was really no rock uh, whatsoever. Um, I played some U2, U2 for someone, and it was the first time they'd heard it, and REM was completely unknown, um, and, and so forth. Um, and so there were very different sort of paces and temporalities of it, and perhaps we can get into that more, but at the moment I just wanted to give a, a brief overview. And that's me. Okay. <laughs> So next up, we have uh, Ab Abdur Amani Sisako, a filmmaker, uh, Sisako, sorry, who was born in Mauritania and raised in Mali. Uh, he's, he, we've been watching his films through the program the last few days. Uh, Bombico is uh, the most recent of them, uh, but his work goes back to the 19, 1990 short film Le Joux and the 2002 film Waiting for Happiness. Uh, and he's going to share some of his thoughts with us. Merci. Je vais parler en français. Parce que je maîtrise pas beaucoup l'anglais. La dame qui est à côté de moi va traduire. Thank you. I'm going to speak in, in French because I don't master English very well. And the lady sitting next to me is going to translate. Uh, my <laughs> and she's my wife. Je me retrouve dans une situation spéciale. I find myself in a special situation. Parce que je viens d'un pays, d'un continent. Because I come from a country, a continent. Qui est le consommateur de, de tout ça. That's the consumer of all these. Et, et qui ne produit pas d'images. But that does not, but hardly produces any images. Euh, c'est une situation assez triste pour euh, mon pays, euh, 
It's a sad situation for my country, Mais de façon beaucoup plus large, uh, but in a larger Africain. way for the African continent. Parce que si uh, est un miroir, Because if the images are a mirror, imaginez que vous rentrez tous les soirs chez vous, imagine you go every night in your home, vous rentrez dans votre salle de bain, in your bathroom, et vous voyez quelqu'un d'autre devant vous, and you see somebody else in front of you. Je pense que c'est une situation d'acculturation réelle. It's a situation of a culturization, a real acculturation. Réelle et terrible. And a terrible one. Parce que les telenovelas mexicaines en particulier. Because in particular the Mexican telenovelas. Occupe la plupart des écrans de télévision africains. Take the space in the majority of African television. Et, euh, et un pays euh, comme la Mauritanie, a country like Mauritania, les dix dernières années, the last ten years, euh, a produit trois films, produced um, three films, et, et tristement, je suis le réalisateur de ces trois films. <laughs> and, and sadly, I'm, I'm the director of the three films. Euh, <laughs> et et c'est vraiment une situation euh, triste. So it's a very um, sad situation. Yeah. Parce qu'on se rend compte que entre les films, because we realize that between the films, qui ne sont pratiquement pas vus aussi dans le pays, that, are, that themselves are hardly seen in the countries, euh, la population regarde d'autres images, that the population is watching other images, euh, dans la forme des, des telenovelas, in the form of telenovelas, euh, qu'elles soient mexicaines ou brésiliennes, whether they're Mexican or Brazilian, ou un peu égyptiennes aussi, or maybe a little bit Egyptian, voilà pour les pays. Arabophone for the Arab, Arabophone countries. Et donc c'est pourquoi je disais que je suis dans une situation de consommateur. So I would be uh, in a situation of a, the consumer uh, side. De, de ce que j'appelle la malbouffe en fait. Of mm. what I would call um, mm. bad eating. Uh, plus tu en manges, tu as encore faim et tu vas encore manger. The, the more you eat, the more you're hungry and you're going to eat more. Et ça te fait pas beaucoup de bien. And it doesn't really help you for mais, your health. Mais tu le manges. But you continue eating. Voilà. Comme euh, d'autres boissons qui sont assez célèbres dans ce continent. Like other drinks that are famous in this continent. Et pas seulement en Afrique d'ailleurs. Not only in Africa. Euh, que tout le monde boit. That everybody drinks. Euh, c'est pas forcément la meilleure boisson. It's not necessarily the best drink. Mais c'est la boisson qui s'est imposée. <coughs> But it's a drink that imposes itself. Ouais. Et je pense que les telenovelas dans, dans la consommation africaine. So I, I think that telenovelas in the African consumption, Bollywood, or Bollywood, mais un peu uh, différemment, Bollywood a bit differently, sont des produits de consommation, are products of consumption, comme d'autres produits qui existent qui sont pas l'image, qui sont like other products that exist that are not images, également consommés dans le continent africain, that are also consumed. L'Afrique produit très peu de choses, so Africa produces very few Elle things, produit très peu d'images, very few images. Mais l'autre situation, à mon avis, qui est plus grave, je dirais, But the other situation, in my opinion, that I think is more grave, qui est dans cette prolifération d'images euh, et de communication, in this prolification of image and communication, il y a un continent qui reçoit des images, there's a continent that receives images, et qui n'en produit pas, but that does not produce. C'est-à-dire, il y a un sentiment comme si ce continent n'a pas de choses à partager avec l'autre. There's a feeling as if this continent does not have anything to share. With Donc il n'y a pas une fluidité. So there's no flu fluid exchange. Et, et je pense que tout lieu a une richesse pour le transmettre à l'autre. And I believe that all place has a richness to transmit to another. Mais cette transmission ne se fait pas. But this transmission does not happen. Parce que déjà il y a une condescendance de. Because de, already there's a condescendance. Sur la notion même de culture. Of even on the notion of culture parce qu'il y a une culture qui se sent plus forte because it's a culture that feels stronger et plus elle domine plus elle se sent forte and the more it's dominating more it feels stronger Mais la notion même de culture elle est le contraire de ça but the notion of culture is actually the opposite of that la culture c'est ce qui est particulier chez l'autre because culture is what's particular in the other où, où on a besoin de prendre si that we need to go, go and get mais <coughs> un peuple qui ne fait que recevoir but um, people that only receive et qui ne donne pas uh, à l'autre l'autre ne prend pas ce qu'il a but that the other does not take uh, n'a pas le sentiment qu'il participe 
does not have the feeling of participating commun, in this common effort, qui est la construction humanité, uh, which is the construction of humanity, uh, plus égalitaire, more and plus curieux more equal, des uns and that's curious of one of the other. Ça, c'est mon introduction et je That's suis là pour my introduction and I'm here écouter surtout ce que mes collègues panélistes ont dit to to qui me passionne. Et si nécessaire, je peux répondre à des questions. And if necessary, I can answer questions. Okay. So as, as I said in the introduction, what we wanted to do here was give snapshots of three very different local, or four very different local media scenes as they've been impacted by the global flow or the barriers to global, global transmission of media. Um, the, one of the things that struck me just listening to this is the emphasis on piracy as a mechanism by which media travels across national borders, uh, for better or for worse. It seems like each of you touched on this in one way or another. And I wonder if we could elaborate a little more about the relationship between legal and extra-legal or illegal systems of circulation and how that's impacting the different scenes that you look at. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Um, uh, Telenovelas uh, are broadcast, but these days people just watch them on YouTube. Uh, I know that I'm doing right now a case study of a telenovela produced in Venezuela, and the, uh, Venevision, the network, has forbidden or has vetoed the transmission on YouTube or any of these uh, video sharing places of this telenovela. So if you're in Venezuela, you can watch. If you're outside, it says, this video is not allowed in, your, in the country where you are trying to watch. Well, people around the world, most of them Venezuelans at first, said, well, hello. And so there is this guy, and he's placing the videos in a blog, in a blogger blog. And, all, and there's a community around it, and they don't tell anyone. They don't tell that address to anyone. I don't tell it to anyone because I am watching there too. This is my object of study. And now this guy has included a chat on this blog. So any time of the day you go into this blog, you can see not only the episodes, and he's only one evening behind, let me tell you, okay? And you can see people chatting live about what's happening, and they have produced a community. They talk about the country. Why are they saying this in the telenovela? Oh, it's probably self-censorship because of this and this. They do a whole lot of analysis. So it's interesting because uh, there is piracy in that sense, but there's also piracy in Spain in particular. There are lots of people who go on the web and advertise services that they will tape a telenovela for you via satellite and they sell it to you very expensive. When that happened, the major producers, like Televisa, decided to produce abridged versions of telenovelas. You can buy a whole telenovela on Amazon on $14.95, and it will not be the whole telenovela, not 120 hours, but 40 hours. And that hasn't worked. People still go to YouTube and to other places. It's like people will want to watch their thing no matter what. At, at one level, it's useful, I guess, to just start with thinking about relations between the legal and the extra legal. <coughs> For instance, just very recently, in almost to, as if to coincide with this global convention celebrating a decade of globalization, the MPA set up an office in Bombay to figure out ways to monitor and possibly clamp down on the kind of piracy that happens there. And even more recently, there were full page ads taken out in newspapers, English language newspapers in particular, warning filmmakers in Bombay away from trying to adapt uh, the recent Brad Pitt film, the one in which he ages backwards, what's it called? Benjamin the Benjamin, Benjamin Button. Button film, right? So it's, it's okay, but that kind of relationship between the legal and the extra legal seems not only, it doesn't seem very productive at one level because one of the things to recognize right away that in cities across Asia, across parts of Africa, and even in Latin America, 
a significant way in which so-called legal media circulate are actually through cultures of the copy. So in many ways, for instance, with say early television, the way in which cable expanded into homes across Asia was through local neighborhoods, young men stringing cables across rooftops, which enabled the kind of spread of cable TV in ways that would not have been possible otherwise. Um, diaspora culture, if you were to think about that, diaspora culture is a culture of circulation. And so it seems, instead of thinking about this sort of legal, extra legal binary, it's perhaps much more useful to think about the ways in which these two realms actually inform each other and the way in which, for example, fans of a film music director will, at the same time that they're actually setting up BitTorrent sites to circulate songs online, will also go to the local neighborhood pirate and tell him to remove the songs, get a full series of their favorite film music director off his shelves because they want that film music director's CDs to sell more. So it's a much more contradictory and sort of ambivalent relationship to the legal and the extra legal than this kind of discourse of piracy allows us to acknowledge. Yeah, I mean, I might jump in on that and that it, it would be important to, to point out that there would be very little media moving around Malawi <clears throat> if not for piracy. Uh, I mean, take movies, for instance, there are, there are no official movie cinemas, in, even in the, the cities in Malawi. This is a, a very poor country that uh, the multinational corporations uh, that make a lot of the media that gets uh, pirated, th these corporations just don't aren't interested in Malawi. They can't make money from Malawi because they can't charge or they won't charge low enough. Uh, and so movies in, in Malawi particularly move through piracy and, and through piracy alone. Um, and a large amount of music moves that way too. Uh, so, I mean, on one level, you know, one sort of has to throw off a sense of, of caring about, you know, the, the poor plight of Time Warner and so forth um, very early. Uh, on the other hand, I would point out that it, it, this is the curse that, that really kills Malawian media production in and of itself. Um, when I was there, almost every day there would be a newspaper article about uh, Malawi's attempts to try and, and get better uh, uh, laws to work against piracy, not because they cared about you know, sort of making sure that, uh, that Disney and so forth uh, were making yet more money, um, but so that local Malawian musicians uh, could actually make some kind of money rather than having to work as you know, uh, research assistants for, for farm projects looking into HIV because they, they're, as much as they're famous, they, they're, uh, they're, they're productions basically just don't make the money there. Uh, so I mean, I think there are really sort of two very different forms of piracy there. The, the, the one that sort of makes media move in the first place, uh, but, but then also the, 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 the attention to the, the piracy that actually stops production and makes it very hard for many people to actually go into making media at any level. <coughs> Do you have anything you wish to add? Euh, J'aimerais dire deux mots sur, euh, sur la piraterie en, en Afrique. I would like to say two words about piracy in Africa. Et qui ressemble un peu euh, aux consommateurs de juin qu'on qu traque, that, aux fumeurs. That looks a bit like the consumers of a joint that we, we look for. Et, euh, mais pas le producteur. Parce que But comme, not the producer. Comme, comme il disait, il euh, y a des, des centaines de milliers as it was said, like you know, hundreds of thousands of pirated films are in Africa. Comme le film de Bolivus Slumdog Millionaire. Like Slumdog Millionaire. That we saw in Africa, it was seen at the same time as the Western world. But these are hundreds of thousands of products that were made outside. And it's difficult to trace where uh, the producers. Machines. The majority of these films come from China. Uh, moi -même, quand je suis pour Bamako, mon film, 
myself when I went there to China to show my film Bamako. C'était un vendredi. It was a Friday. Et le lundi, c'était dans tous les grands magasins, le film était piraté. And on Monday, it was already pirated in, in, in most of the shops avec, I found. Avec des couvertures beaucoup plus jolies que le, with la cover, sortie française. With a cover much nicer than our French uh, cover of the Donc film. Donc ça veut dire que c'est une vraie industrie. So it means that it's a real industry. De penser, de it's something that's been thought through. À des gens qui sont jamais touchés. That, that's profitable to people that are never touched. There is another film, legal circulation of films dont parler, qui, à mon that, avis, est that I'd like to talk to Afrique. that I think is very um, serious. Ce sont les télévisions africaines, it's the um, um, African les télévisions television. Publiques public television et qui en contrepartie de de montrer de la publicité who like to balance you know of showing advertisement montre des telenovelas instead of advertisement show telenovelas pour remplir les heures en fait and it's actually just to fill the time spaces parce qu'il n'y a pas une production Local, donc Because there's no local production or nothing slotted for that time. Sans réfléchir vraiment sur les conséquences. Donc, Without really thinking of the consequences. Et je pense que là, il y a une vraie démission politique. And here, I think there's a real demission of the, from the political euh, part. Parce que euh, dans un pays où il y a 70 à 60 d'analphabètes, in a country where you have 60 to 70 percent that are not uh, analphabets. La, la télévision, c'est facile. C'est une école. La télévision, c'est une école. Donc, l'écran, c'est une école. So, the, the screen is a school. Donc, si tu le remplis de choses qui ne sont pas bien, c'est. So, if you fill it up with, with content that's Donc, not. C'est une, une mauvaise awesome, école. Then it's a bad school. So, it's one of the things that I did want to add, which your comment sparked, was when we talk about piracy in this legal, extra legal sort of, if you keep falling into that line of discussion, it really leads us to ignore the fact that cultures of circulation are also cultures of production. Um, and I recognize that the, we need to make this very, very context specific. But the ways in which certain parts of the world are able to actually enter into an engagement with different kinds of emergent media technologies be they productions of VCDs, be they subtitling of DVDs within a day of its release in some part of the world, and the way in which it then gets circulated, it's not, the circulation then needs to be thought much <coughs> more broadly in terms of circulation of not just the <coughs> artifacts, the cultural products themselves, but also of certain kinds of skills and abilities to produce and remake certain kinds of media technologies that are part of the discussion. So one of the questions that your comments sparked was, when you think about cities like Kano or Lagos or even Johannesburg and the kinds of circulation that happen through these regional media centers, isn't, aren't yeah. those evidence that there are maybe other things that are happening absolutely. in the landscape of media production yeah. in Africa, not just about yeah, receiving and circulation, but actual production that happens? Je dois répondre? Comme tu veux. Je pense que c'est un exemple particulier, le Nigeria. I think that Nigeria or South Africa are yeah. particular examples yeah. or that have a, a, an enormous production, yeah. which is a, a good thing. Because at least the mirror that I was talking about earlier, at least they can, people can see themselves projected. Un voleur, mais so the, the aussi un children can see that it's their mm. father can be the, the thief or the doctor. Donc il y a, il y a la société est mieux racontée. So at least the society is better told to itself. Le Nigeria est un pays particulier. Nigeria is a particular country. Et, uh, de la même façon, les Nigérians font des, des pneus de voiture. In the same way that they make the the products, they, they make the, oui. the tires of the cars. Euh, que tu peux acheter si tu n'as pas beaucoup de moyens. That you can buy for, for if you don't have without much means. Que tu peux utiliser. Donc, that euh, you can use. Et ça marche dans les voitures. And it works in the cars. Mais euh, la qualité euh, n'est pas la même. En fait. But the quality is not the same. 
Et je crois que dans les téléloups, dans les, dans les films nigériens, c'est aussi ça. And I think that Mais moi, je pense que c'est moins de mal. Films, it's also that, but c'est at least c'est, it's, c'est it's très a, important que c'est plus less, local. C'est plus un problème. C'est très important qu'il y ait une production locale. Donc, pour continuer à répondre à ça, vous pouvez vous dire quelque chose sur les systèmes de circulation qui shapent le flot de vos films au monde I mean, Vous venez d'une très different kind of film culture than the Nigerian one, clearly. But how, how, are, how are you succeeding in getting your films out to larger populations? Moi, je suis allé, je suis allé au, au cinéma. Bon, je suis allé faire des études de cinéma uh, d'abord. I'm, I went to, st- to study film uh, in first the in, the, in the Soviet Union qui m'a pris beaucoup de temps and that took me a long time. et qui aussi a forgé euh, ma relation avec l'image, avec le cinéma. But I, that also set up my relationship with image and cinema. Donc je fais un certain film, un certain cinéma. So I do a certain kind of film qui n'a pas une grande popularité. Which is not, a, which does not have a big pop, it's not very popular. Nulle part. Nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Comme le cinéma indépendant. Like some of some independent films. Uh, mais je, je pense que à partir du moment où il y a une personne. Uh, But I think that as long as there's one person. Qui s'intéresse à une chose. That's interested in one thing. Pour moi, c'est beaucoup. For me, that's a lot. Et donc, je considère que j'ai une chance où mes films sont un peu vus. So I consider myself donc, lucky that my films are seen a bit. J'existe plus en tant que cinéaste. Um, I exist more because of I'm an author, mais, what is mais author fru- writer, director. Mais la vraie frustration, c'est quand on fait des films que But the real frustration is when we make films. Que ce film n'a presque pas de chance d'être vu dans ton pays. And, the, and, and often the film has very little chance to get seen in your own country. Alors que tu as utilisé les acteurs de ton pays. But yet you used the actors of your country. L'histoire du pays. The story of the country. Chose, mais il n'y a pas d'écran qui est prêt. Uh, but there's no, there's no screening rooms or theaters to show. Il y a une chose them. que je me permets de dire parce que c'est une réalité. And there's one thing I would like to permit myself to say because it's si a reality. Si je donne mon film, le film à la télévision de mon pays, if I give if I gave my film to the television of my country, ils sont capables de me demander de l'argent pour montrer. They they can ask me to pay for it to show my film. Yeah. Donc c'est pas eux qui me payent. So it's not <laughs> them c'est paying me, qui, voilà. but it's uh, myself. Et c'est une, c'est une, c'est pas, c'est, c'est, c'est la réalité. And that's the reality. Donc c'est, c'est, on est profondément triste quand on vit des situations comme ça. So we're very saddened when we live this kind of situation. Et on sait qu'on ne peut pas le changer. Aujourd'hui. And we know that we cannot change it so, in one day or today. Mes films circulent, maybe. Mes films passent. Euh, bon, pour prendre mon dernier film qui a eu. Plus de succès que les précédents. Take the example of my last film that had more success than the previous ones. Uh, a été beaucoup médiatisé parce que c'était au festival de Cannes. It was ha- got a lot of press and media because it was at the Cannes Festival. Uh, donc il y a un distributeur uh, assez. Donc, so I had a French distributor. Qui a vendu le film un peu partout. Who sold the film um, internationally. Voilà, dans les États-Unis. Uh, as well as in the States. Avec un distributeur. Uh, New Yorker, New Yorker, the distributor, the New Yorker film distributor, qui vient de fermer. That just closed down. Ouais. Et c'est même difficile d'avoir le film aux États-Unis maintenant. So now it's difficult to get the film in, in the United States. C'est juste pour dire la fragilité. It's just to show the fr- de how fragile cinéma. these films are. Et la fragilité aussi de ceux qui font la distribution. And how films. fragile the people who are distributing this kind of films are. In this country. In this, in this country. So I want, I'd like to have the panelists talk about genre a little bit, which is an issue that cropped up across a number of the presentations. And we clearly, art films or, or independent films travel differently around the planet than melodramas or action films or musicals. So what role do you, why do some genres seem to generate the global flow that you're describing? Or whether it's the action films that are, that John found are, uh, the film, the productions you've talked about. 
I think in the case of telenovelas, um, there are several factors that make it so uh, well received <laughs> globally. One is melodrama. Melodrama is universal and you know, it's been used even in our coverage of the Olympics. How do we cover the Olympics now? We, we make it melodramatic. You know, we create the hero myth in every one of our athletes. You know, that it's a Cinderella story. The Cinderella story in particular, which is repeated in many telenovelas, resonates in many cultures because the face of poverty around the world many times has the face of a woman. And so it resonates elsewhere. Um, in addition to that, there is what Mr. Sisake just said. This is a very cheap way to feel the airwaves. When you buy a telenovela, you have uh, material for one hour, for every day of the week, for at least four months. It could be four to eight months, cheap. So that's another, another reason, especially in Eastern Europe, when it went through the transition, this was an easy way to feel the airwaves. And now, of course, there is the, the, not the consumption, now there is the addiction, because they are addictive. Because people think, oh no, they're not, you know, only, only I've heard so many people there say, only stupid people consume them, because they are of massive consumption and massive deprecation too. But I want to, any of you, I challenge you to sit through two episodes of a telenovela, two episodes. And then you tell me if you don't want to know what's gonna happen. And I've tested this every semester with my own students. And it's amazing. So they have something in them. Um, and um, I, I think also that telenovelas, what are they? You know, there's a famous Venezuelan writer who once said Teleno telenovelas are the spectacle of sentiments, of emotions. And that's universal, emotions and sentiments. And this is why people identify with these strange stories that can be some of them very strange uh, all over the world. So that's for telenovelas. I think Bollywood has a lot of melodrama too. It does, but I'm not, again, I'm a little uncomfortable with this because it seems like we're talking about why certain genres travel, and let's say we take, say, different kinds of television shows, and why one television show gets bought by one, for one part of the world and not another. But it seems like in hindsight, we can, if we talk about, say, notions like cultural proximity, and that's why this particular show was worked in this market. In hindsight, we can discern some sort of a mysterious correspondence in pretty much any sort of media and cultural relationship. I mean, why Bollywood films clicked Bombay Cinema clicked in 70s and 80s Nigeria. One way to explain it that Brian Larkin does is to talk about notions of parallel modernities, so that certain changes that were happening in youth culture and in other parts of Nigeria resonated with that. But to speak about like, say, these sorts of universalistic categories of emotion and melodrama and so on, again, I'm not sure how far it gets us in thinking about global media flows. And maybe Jonathan can add a little bit here about the ways in which industry executives justify the decision to buy and syndicate and circulate certain kinds of media products, rely on these sorts of assumptions about some correspondence between what will work here and what won't work. And thinking about the way in which we've talked about media globalization and how television and film circulate around the world, maybe notions of cultural proximity are not really that useful at the end of the day. I don't know if you. I mean, my my first my first sort of res response when I when I was in Malawi was to to look at how much melodrama <coughs> there seemed to be across different sort of media. So that again, that a lot of the the sort of Celine Dion um, "I Can't Live Without You" lyrics, um, which by the way were uh, crossed over uh, regardless of of gender too. Um, but uh, so it wasn't uh, as coded as, as feminine as, as it tends to be uh, in, in America. Um, but at the same time, I then started to find that there were all these exceptions out there. Um, so that, I mean, a lot of the, the songs that are really popular um, from within Dolly's, um, you know, Irv, and they're all there. Um, but a lot of the, the songs that are popular there are actually a lot more sort of, they're not about not just about, you know, I can't live without you there. Some of her more sort of complex, interesting ones. 
Um, and then again, with the, uh, the interest in a lot of uh, African American produced music and, and, um, and movies, uh, or any sort of movie about Africa uh, seemed to circulate too, so that uh, you know the curious case of Benjamin Button would go absolutely nowhere in the average video show. Um, but Hotel Rwanda could be found at pretty much every uh, roadside stop where they were selling stuff. Um, and so, I mean, often the, there needed to be a reason to be interested in it, but uh, I was finding all these exceptions to the sort of supposed rules of what travels well and does doesn't travel well. And I mean, as I suggested earlier, Dolly is a perfect example of that, that it, there's a sort of sense of happenstance that uh, sometimes perhaps we, if we're looking for the sort of easy rules about what travels to where, uh, we, we tend to sort of lose out on a lot. I think of sort of Tim Havens uh, does, does work on sort of the global media marketplace and he talks about, what's his phrase for it? The Industry law. Yeah, industry lore, where he just talks about sort of these, these assumptions that things don't play well. So that, like, traditionally, Hollywood has felt that the rest of the world isn't interested in African American shows, uh, even though there's absolutely no real data to back that up. And I remember growing up as a child moving around the world when I was in Singapore. Um, the facts of life was huge in Singapore and Malaysia, and it was marketed solely as a as a as Trudy Tudi or Trudy Tudi show. Um, and, and, and she was at the center of it and she was the hero of it. And, and yet that goes completely against industry law, law that would normally say, no, 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 don't put in that African-American character because the rest of the world don't want to hear about. It. Uh, so there are the dangers of, finding, of trying to find those, uh, those simple rules. And the, one of the things <coughs> that was interesting that emerged from the entire media convention was this was right around the time that Slumdog was getting more awards and leading up to the Oscars. And so, of course, all the panels featured someone from Fox Searchlight, and all the questions were about, well, can we replicate this? And of course, everybody was trying to you know, come up with reasons for why it worked across the world, why it worked in this market, and why it worked somewhere else. But the happenstance seems to be crucial, because the one thing that seemed guaranteed is every sales agent, every distributor who attended the convention did say at the end of the day that they will now look twice and think twice before rejecting something that had anything South Asian to do with it. So to that extent, perhaps these sorts of correspondences mm -hmm. do work. But beyond that, I'm not sure notions of genre, melodrama, or kung fu action cinema, why they travel to one part or another, they need to be much more locally specific, like the work you're doing in Malawi. And we need to be much more careful about that. Uh, <coughs> I think um, I think that there is a um, principle of addiction uh, but that's explainable because of the mass quantity that's sent. And when you send the same thing all the, again and again all the time. And on top, there's also the melodramatic side. L'émotion est là. That emotion is there. Il y a la souffrance de gens, mais qui sont beaucoup plus riches que toi. There's a suffering of these people who are, regardless of how much richer than yourself they are, because they're in these big houses and beautiful houses. Mais que dedans on souffre. But inside them they are suffering. Je pense que ça c'est quelque chose qui intéresse aussi les gens. And I think that is something that interests people. J'ai pas fait d'études là-dessus, mais vous êtes mieux placés. It's not something I've studied, but you're probably better placed for it. L'effet but I consider that there's an openness to the matter. My, my wife was telling me earlier in my ear <laughs> that in Ethiopia there was a time where the Japanese telenovela was very popular. Donc ça a disparu parce qu'il n'y a plus de uh, It's less now because they're not as much visible. They still exist, actually, on Ethiopian television. And some, a lot of people know them by heart, or know the characters really well. So and I wanted to ask you about the scene in Bombaco that has Danny Glover in it, and what his role is in that production, and what you intended to comment on in that scene. Maybe you could share a little bit of the scene mm -hmm. with the crowd here. Yes, we partage un peu la scène de Danny Glover qui est montré à la télé tout ça pour éviter les petits spectateurs qui sont dans le West le paquet. Dans Bamako, il y a il y a un petit moment qui dure peut-être 
4 minutes. And Bamako, there's a moment that lasts about four minutes. That's a film within a film. So in a courtyard, there are people watching television like they do every night. Donc il y a le, le début d'un film, donc il y a un western. So it's western the beginning of a film, a spaghetti western. Que j'ai tourné moi-même. That I film, shot myself. Avec Danny Glover. With Danny Glover. Euh, parce que Danny Glover. Euh, Because Danny Glover film, helped me financially to make the film he co-produced. Euh, donc il a d'abord supporté le sens du film. Of course, he first of helped in the sense of the. Film. Towards the film. Et après, euh, moi j'avais cette séquence de western. And then I had the sequence idea of the sequence of the western. J'ai décidé de, de, de filmer mes amis. In which I wanted to, to film my friends as actors. Et donc je proposais à Danny Glover de venir. So I asked Danny Glover, you know, if he could come. Voilà sa participation. And that's how he participated. Mm. Et, et, euh, mais ça montre euh, dans Bamako euh, que la télé euh, est un moment d'évasion très fort. And it also shows in Bamako that te television is a moment of evasion or runaway space for people. Et je pense que c'est dû au fait que euh, dans une famille euh, où, où il y a, il y a 20 personnes qui, qui habitent. In a family where there's 20 people that live together. Euh, Peut-être qu'il n'y a pas cinq livres disponibles. Maybe there's not five books available. Donc on va quand même vers quelque chose so we go towards qui est plus accessible. Something that's more accessible. Et moi je connais euh, dans notre famille. I know euh, in our family. Euh, les, les servantes qui travaillent à the, la maison. The workers that work in the house, the people that help. Regarde les telenovelas, euh, que ce soit brésilien ou mexicain. Follow the telenovelas, whether they're Brazilian or Mexican. Euh, sans comprendre un seul mot, c'est incroyable. But follow them without knowing a single word. Ouais, parce qu'ils parlent même pas français. Because they don't even speak French or any other language. Mais ils veulent pas rater un épisode. But they will never miss, voilà. um, as she said, an, an, Donc, an episode. Ça veut dire beaucoup de choses, je crois. So yeah. that's what TV means a lot of things. Donc, il y a un besoin qui est créé. That there's a need that's created by it. Uh, I promised that the audience would get a chance to ask questions. We've let this opening segment go a little long, but I'm eager to see questions from the floor. There are two mics down there, and if anyone has a question to get us started, if not, uh, we'll buy us some time by asking another. Oh, please, Anna. Hi. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about co-production in these different regions. Um, there's this idea that if we co-produce, then we're broadening the market. Um, and, but then we get these cases where you have that, you know, with the movies with Spain, you always have that Cuban movie with an old <coughs> revolutionary uh, anarchist uh, uncle or whatever that, just, what is he doing there? And, uh, you know, that has totally changed the, uh, the co-production policies have uh, changed the aesthetics of uh, much of Latin American film. Um, I wonder how that is uh, affecting um, telenovelas and what happens, and I don't know in, in Africa what the reality of co-production is. I am speaking from Costa Rica, which is my case. Um, Our situation is that we co-produce or we die also, but, but it's related to financing. Um, and we just have to deal with our monster neighbors because in fact, we we're talking now about Brazil and Mexico and it sounds like Latin America is producing so much, but at least in film, um, 90% of all films made in Latin America from the very beginning have been made in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, and that's it. So, um, okay, comment and question, but co-production. <laughs> co-production. Um, well, co-production is what the, the Telemundo model, it's not only theirs, but they are the ones who have made it very successful. Why do they co-produce? Because it's, ve it's cheaper to have actors placed in Colombia where uh, you pay Colombian salaries, 
okay, instead of Miami salaries. So, and also you use all these actors there. Of course, you, you, you save the big bucks for the big stars, which are those protagonists that at least one of them has to be Mexican, okay? Uh, you're very right about the issue of films. I think Colombia, just like it is coming up, has come up in telenovelas, has come up also in film. It is sort of the, the, the new kid on the block. Um, Venezuela, just like it is lagging in telenovelas now, it is lagging in films, even though President Chavez has created a film villa to produce films, and he has given money even to Danny Glover uh, mm -hmm. to produce films in Venezuela. Of course, these films have to be with a particular point of view, let's call it that way. Um, I think there are other uh, there are countries in which the only way they can play the production game is by co-producing. So there is a model right now in which the Miami model is being used, co-produced with countries like Panama, the Dominican Republic. So they make one telenovela in the Dominican Republic in which the protagonists, the antagonists, are this multinational cast of heavy hitters. Everyone else is from the Dominican Republic. And that's the only way they can produce a telenovela. And let me tell you, the Dominican Republic is a huge consumer of telenovelas. Countries that do not produce telenovelas in Latin America tend to be the largest consumers, actually. So they have tried this model in the Dominican Republic, recently in Panama. And we have to see how it sells abroad. Uh, to me, the issue is that now the model is that melodramatic model, is a model that tells the same story with little variations, but it's, uh, it's not saying anything. Telenovelas can say a lot, and there's lots of research about telenovelas being very effective in health campaigns, for instance. In Venezuela, extremely effective in the political discourse, also in Brazil. But the model that is being sold abroad, the model that is circulating with success, is a model that really sells very well, but doesn't say much. Say more, 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 un peu particulier, peut-être c'est mieux de parler. Um, my case is a bit particular, so perhaps it's better to speak uh, in general Parce or maybe je, je on telenovelas in Africa, because I live in France. Et, uh, Arte France qui produit, qui so co it's mes Arte films. France that co-produces my films. Et, uh, et la France est un pays européen qui a une politique de financement des films. Uh, so the France is one of the European countries that have a politic of financing mm -hmm. films that's quite form incredible. Donc, uh, une société qui coproduit avec Arte, avec une so I have a we have production that co-produces with Arte. De dans so de I have the advantage of the finances or commissions. Mais je voudrais parler de, de telenovelas africains qui commencent à naître. But I would like to talk, for example, about the African telenovelas that are starting to exist. Par exemple, il y a une telenovela en Côte d'Ivoire. For example, there are telenovelas in Ivory Coast. Bon, parce que c'est en français, donc c'est regardé dans tous les pays. Because it's in French, so it's viewed in all the French-speaking African countries. Et il y a des telenovelas qui se font au Burkina Faso and there are others that are made in Burkina Faso. Et qui commence à utiliser des acteurs ivoiriens, maliens. And they also start to use mm. actors from mm. Ivory Coast or Mali. Et donc pour cela, ils commencent à avoir des petites coproductions. So for those they start co-produce having small co-production with each Mais other. Il faut savoir aussi que tout ça devient de plus en plus possible. But one has to know that all this becomes more and more possible. Parce que dans le développement dans le, de, de l'Afrique, dans le combat quotidien, in the of Africa, in the daily struggle, les gens commencent à, se com à compter sur eux-mêmes. People are starting to count on themselves. Non, on n'attend pas les choses qui viennent d'ailleurs. So we don't no longer wait as much for things coming from outside. Il y a quelque chose de dynamique qu'on voit dans so beaucoup de domaines. So there's this dynamism that we see in many domains. Et 
et dans le cinéma, même s'il y a très très peu de films qui sont produits. But are also in cinema, even though there are very very few films that are produced. Okay, Chen. Hi. Um, so I'm actually curious for with the first two provocations that Henry brought up. I was wondering if we could um, push them together a little bit because. As when you talked about the necessity of having sort of a cultural specificity and baked into that, it seems there's this question of not like a technologically determinist platform specificity, but so the sort of regulations and structures and protocols that surround the encounters of media as it moves and how that changes what content circulates and then how that content in turn shapes the sort of flows and spaces of transmission. So I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about how, I guess if we have to fall into the legal, extra legal binary, how the different modes of circulation affects maybe what media, what kinds of media circulates, what telenovelas for instance, if they're the same as the ones that are being sort of pushed outward by the national broadcast producers, um, and if the different kinds of say fan engagements affect how that media is then sort of processed and used? Um, that's a large question Sorry. to tackle, but <laughs> I'm just racking my brains about where to begin. Um, one way to maybe start thinking about it is to say, let's going back to the co-production aspect of it, is co-production immediately reminds us that state institutions are very, very vested in it and that there are certain kinds of cultural policy decisions that shape what kinds of co-productions are allowed and not allowed. And co-productions also remind us that every co-production is an encounter of translation between different kinds of production cultures. And the, built into that is also what finally then gets to, what finally then circulates across the world. So speaking in just in terms of the Bollywood context, one of the dangers of using the term Bollywood, even though it allows, gives us some specificity in this panel, it actually erases a lot of other boundaries about what actually is circulating. So the first mapping that we did, say from Bombay to London to LA, that mapping only suggests that only a certain kind of Bollywood cinema circulates because the diasporic market in the UK and the US has been constructed in a very specific way over the last 15 years which gets complicated even further by the fact that within the US, the trajectory of South Asian, Ameri South Asian migration means that certain model minority discourses fit into the way in which consumption of Bollywood happens, which in turn filters all the way back to Bombay, which then leads to further sorts of industry lore getting sedimented as saying, okay, these films work. Let's just keep pushing these films out. But then if you look at another mapping, another historical moment, say from New Delhi, the central government making certain decisions about their geopolitical ties. And then a certain kind of melodramatic films actually travel into Russia and into Eastern European former socialist bloc countries. And then when we move to say the African context, the much more angry young man films of the 70s of a popular star Amitabh Bachchan, those are the ones that, that were traveling around. Mm -hmm. so, those are the sorts of examples that come to mind, which remind us of the ways in which the national continues to play a role in these kinds of transnational circulations, and the way in which state institutions continue to regulate the ways in which certain content and certain kinds of films get to move around the world and not others. I'm not sure that even begins to tackle that question, but. <laughs> I, I think it also shows the degree to which we need to study who the pirates are. Um, and I mean, I can understand why a lot of the times people don't want to because we are the pirates. Um, <laughs> okay. the, the forerunner of this did a lot of burning um, while I was in, in Malawi, but, uh, or because we don't want to draw attention to them. But <clears throat> uh, with the example I gave of, of how country music became popular, uh, the, the answer to that question that I kept on ask, asking was basically who were the pirates? How did it get there? Um, and, and so I, I think there's still, there needs to be a lot more study of uh, who's taking these things from, from culture to culture and place to place. Um, and what are the interests there and, and what, are the, what are the sort of, what kind of interaction uh, they have with the people there too. 
Uh, for instance, in, in Malawi, I also noticed that, that Bollywood was almost nowhere to be seen. Um, there's a, a long sort of tense relationship between Malawians and between the Indian population in, in India that I think when I talk to people was partly responsible. Uh, that they, again, there was a sense there that they didn't want to watch Indian media because they didn't like Indian people. And so I, I think sometimes just asking the, the questions of, of who brought the media and, and, and what are the, how do, what do we think about these people and what, do they, what else do they bring with them uh, starts to open up a lot, of, uh, a lot of answers to other questions. I, I would like to add is that in the realm of telenovelas, there is this question about, okay, so if you, if people watch a telenovela on YouTube or somewhere else, if that telenovela is sold to their country, will they watch it? We, does having the telenovela on YouTube <coughs> increases or decreases the potential, the sales potential of that telenovela? And I've asked this question to several people in the business and you can't find one answer. Some think, no, 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 it increases sales. No, no, it decreases sales. So while I just told you that story about Venevisión in Venezuela and told you the story about Televisa, Telemundo, for instance, they put every day their episode of Doña Bárbara, El Rostro de Anali, they put it on the web for everyone to watch. And Doña Bárbara, in the last two months, has been the most widely sold telenovela in the world. And they have the episodes there. So there is that question about, is telenovela watching a thing we do on computers? Or if we have the choice to watch it as a family at home, is that how we watch? So the patterns of consumption, I think we can't forget them when we think about all these concepts that are so blurred now, distribution, consumption, circulation, production, all those. Yeah, and just one quick addition is there's no reason to assume that the industry professionals aren't talking to the pirates. I mean, so one example is there is a wheeler <coughs> dealer, I guess is the best way to describe him, who lives in Boston, but who travels regularly to <coughs> Chile, Poland, Germany, parts of China, and so on, just looking for fan communities, small subcultural fan communities of, say, Shah Rukh Khan, a Bollywood star, for example. And what he does is he goes there, he hangs out with them, encourages them to form a little club or an association, and actually gets them subtitling rights, things of that sort, organizes screenings, and then goes back to Bombay and talks to the, you know, the legal distributors and the producers and say, here, maybe I've discovered a little market here. Why don't we strike a deal? I'll get this commission, and we'll start, say, pushing a few films into that mm -hmm. market. So <laughs> we need to break, really need to complicate this extra legal, extra legal thing there is absolutely no reason to assume that these different spaces are not already in dialogue with each other. They are. But that's what I think the kind of ethnography that Jonathan is describing would help us get to get into and understand these sorts of networks and dialogues much more. Okay, next. So I guess when we talk about global media, um, you think about barriers, uh, but Essentially, we don't really see one based on distribution um, or really, I guess you could say culture, but instead we see one based around the language. Um, and Carolina started off by saying that if you just watch media, you really don't need to know the language to understand what's going on, uh, depending the situation, of course. Um, but um, as Esmond said uh, during his talk, when the media is distributed, it also teaches people how to produce and essentially uh, create their own works. So I wonder if there's a sort of conflict between um, the dispersal of global media based on the language and how that's affected the development of uh, media in different areas around the world. <laughs> Well, you guys get started, and I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Fan comes to mind. I mean, but you're right that language and geoculture, certain kinds of markets, do impose certain boundaries around this. But that seems to be where it begins, is in small sorts of fansubbing activities, where there is one very popular website 
um, a YouTube channel mm -hmm. set up by a woman, and it's called srkpagli.net. Mm -hmm. I mean, a fan of Shah Rukh Khan. And um, this woman has learned Hindi, learned to subtitle every single thing that Shah Rukh Khan appears in, from advertisements to TV shows to films. And that's where it begins. But yes, there's no getting away from the fact that language organizes certain kinds of flows. And even within certain kinds of countries, especially, say, South Asia, given the number of languages that there are at least seven, eight viable film industries in South Asia at this point in time, but only the Hindi language Bollywood films get privileged as the global media product. The rest are still at best regional or maybe translocal if, you want, if people want to be charitable. But there's a politics to the way in which certain language television and films <coughs> circulate and not others. And I, I think in, a, in the digital, digital age, fan subbing seems to be multi-generational. You can reproduce the thing without diminishing the quality of the original. So when I was in Shanghai a year ago, I met a reporter who's been covering the pirates there. And what she said was that it took less than 24 hours for an episode of Prison Break to air on American television mm -hmm. and to be translated into Cantonese or one of the other major Chinese languages. And it's done by teams of amateur fans who want access to that content. It spreads out to the hinterland via the computer, <coughs> and then the Cantonese version gets translated into a different Chinese language that may deal with a smaller language population. And again, teams are waiting to do that. So it's a 48 hour or 72 hour process as opposed, uh, but the flow of media is, you know, there would have been a time when language was an absolute barrier to that. And it seems to me that it's now multi-stop, but you know, as long as you have digital organization and digital reproduction, it's, it's less complicated a problem than it might have once been. Whereas culture may be, you know, cultural affinity may be much more crucial than language, I think, in the end, in determining uh, what, what circulates. I, I mean, I guess to follow up with that, I mean, if you've been on the internet in, in a year, it's obvious that audiences have uh, taken up the effort to uh, help the distribution of media but in terms of production, uh, has the language barrier really um, solidified certain uh, areas of production enough that um, there hasn't really been uh, a flow between those areas um, in terms of something like genre or just general, uh, general elements of the actual production instead of the reception? I don't know, I think telenovelas are you know, translated and dubbed in almost every language in the world. I think an interesting case I've found is actually inside the United States. Because for a while there, uh, Telemundo had uh, closed caption in Spanish, in English, of its telenovelas. And then suddenly they stopped because of the financial crisis. It's a recent event. Look at her face. And, <laughs> and there was this uproar. And I have a blog, and in my blog, people were writing like crazy in English. What happened? And so there is this other blog in which there is a group of 10 people who are all over the United States, and they, every day, they, each one of them is in charge of one telenovela, and they write recaps in English. Every episode, every day of every telenovela broadcast in the United States. And all these people that were in the uproar are now flocking there, so they watch the episode and then they read without understanding it. And then they go and read the recap. Um, I don't know, the other thing is that I mentioned how in Latin America some people say, I don't like to watch Brazilian telenovelas because they're dubbed and I like my telenovelas in my, in my language, in my native language. I always find that interesting, as interesting as some of my students when they say they don't, they don't go to see foreign films because they have subtitles. And when I tell them, in my country, every Hollywood film has subtitles, it's like they've discovered some new land or something like, wow, really? Well, Latin Americans <laughs> everywhere in the world, people are watching telenovelas either dubbed or with subtitles. So it's not a big deal although it seems to be, so. I mean, I, I would just add too that, uh, uh, I mean, in, in Malawi, there is no fan subbing going on. Um, there aren't many people on, online to begin with, uh, and there isn't the resources for, for um, even official su of subtitling. Uh, so then, I mean, linguistic barriers there are very hard. Uh, I mean, Malawi shares way more of a border with Mozambique than it does with 
either Zambia or Tanzania, and yet you don't hear much about uh, uh, about media from Mozambique in Malawi because Mozambique has a, a different linguistic uh, background, uh, both in terms of um, local dialects, but also in terms of having been a French colony instead of an English colony. Um, and, and so, I mean, there's a, a very hard and fast divide that uh, as much as we can get excited by how fan, and should get excited about how fans and audiences are, are bridging some of these divides um, that then might have some sort of trickle over effect to production. Um, it, it is important to remember that there are many countries in the world that where the finances for such things are just not there. Il y a, moi je voulais ajouter un exemple sur, sur les langues. I wanted to add an example on the languages. Je, je pense qu'il y a des choses qui changent. I think there are things that are changing. Il y a une, une télévision, un câble qui s'appelle AfriCable. For example, there's a, a cable called AfriCable Afri, Afri station. Qui est dans les pays francophones. In the Francophone African countries. C'est une télévision malienne, donc la base c'est au Mali. It's, uh, the base is in Mali. Et qui commence à montrer euh, des séries ghanéennes. That started mm. to show Ghanaian uh, uh, series, en français. but subtitled in French. Et les gens regardent. And so people watch them. Parce que je crois que le fait que c'est Ghanaien, le fait que c'est africain, il y a, it's il y a un besoin, il y a une, uh, une envie. Other African countries, so there's this need, uh, there's this desire of seeing uh, African stories. Des histoires où on peut facilement se reconnaître. Or stories that where you can recognize yourself in them. Mais je pense qu'il faut parler d'autre chose, c'est que que les gens ont une capacité de créer leur propre langue avec l'image aussi. That people have the capacity to create mm. their own language with the images that they see. Sans comprendre forcément l'espagnol. Without necessarily understanding ou, ou, Spanish, ou, mm -hmm. euh, le hindi, hindi ou l'anglais, euh, yeah, les gens. English. Voilà, je pense que ça c'est très fort. And I think that's very important. Cette capacité de déduire tout de suite ce qui va se passer. Parce qu'avec une habitude du cinéma, to deduct what's going to happen avec le langage cinématographique qui fait que les gens comprennent. Because of the language of cinema, the images. Moi, ça c'est le facteur le plus intéressant. And for me, that's the most interesting factor. Uh, one of the themes that keeps appearing in the discussion. Uh, that has appeared in the discussion this afternoon is what we might call the tension between the global and the local. And one of the things that struck me as I thought about the discussion was uh, I thought back to a, a film scholarship <coughs> in the pre-digital age when one of the primary issues for a number of years was the, was, the, was the problem of the major media producers, especially the United States, so flooding local markets with their own material that local filmmakers had very little chance. And as some of you surely know, it was an era in which, in, in which a, a number of national uh, uh, organizations and uh, uh, even legislatures began to create limitations on the, amount of, on the amount of American media, the number of American films that could be shown in particular countries. Now, what I'm, what I'm curious about is whether or not there's some version of this now in the, in the age of global media. That is to say, isn't it possible to imagine that what, we're, what you've all been describing is a circumstance in which it is no longer the case that there is one major media nation that is flooding the market, but that there are a, a, a relatively smaller number, a relatively small number of media, major media producers. Bollywood is one, the telenovela uh, consortium is one, uh, American media continues to be a dominant thing, and, and that these Three or four, and there might be a few others, but these three or four sources coming to dominate global media as well and, 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 and flooding out the possibility that certain kinds of local or, 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 or national uh, media enterprises would be, uh, na national and local media enterprises m might be inhibited or, or, or restrained partly because of the fact that the, that, that, that the global media that is now finding a much easier way to spread itself, even leaving aside the issue of piracy, which increases the problem in certain, in certain ways, creating a situation in which even more intensely than in the era of American dominance of media, we're going to have a relatively small number of sources creating essentially the entertainment for the entire globe. Does this seem like a, a ridiculous fear or, or something to worry about? I, th I think 
Yeah. To some degree, there it's the sort of Coke Pepsi war, right? That if Coke and Pepsi can convince you that you have to choose Coke or Pepsi, you know, they both of them have won in the long run. And and in if it was if the issue used to be American dominance versus local, that's one thing. Whereas I think what at least what I saw in Malawi, and of course this was assisted by the fact that there's very little local production outside of the the realm of, of music, uh, is that the 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 major um, the 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 countries that do flood Malawi with their media, they people can then play them off against each other. So if you resent American presence, um, and certainly a lot of the people I talked to did resent that American presence, and so their response to that was to watch more Nigerian media, or people would feel that Nigerian media was too outlandish and that dealt with witchcraft, and they didn't think that that was right, and so they'd watch lots of American media. And so it, what you you have there is Nigerian media and, and um, American media have sort of become the Coke Pepsi battle, where um, Malawian media and, and the, the possibility of Malawi sort of producing something in between sort of falls up by the wayside. Now, I mean, that might be very peculiar to Malawi given that there isn't the money to, to produce or sort of rival. But um, I, I, at the same time, suppose that there are probably many other countries like that around the world where uh, the, the sort of war that goes on between these sort of global uh, media industries um, leads the sort of local production uh, totally by the wayside. Right, that's, what, that's the issue that I think is of concern. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's useful to remember that American dominance was never complete or never quite spanned the entire globe. There were many other industries that were not so much resisted, but really there was, they had their own trajectories of influence and so on. But you're right, the point you make is one that Michael Curtin has made recently as well in thinking about relations between media capitals instead of continuing to think about whether one media capital dominates the world. But, yeah. I mean, perhaps public access television in the US is a good example of how local media production is, is increasingly difficult to do. OK. Yep. Uh, all right, well, thank you so much for coming. It's been a great discussion.